Ravel, the California Kid. Ravel was based in Venice, California. Started by Lou Glazer shortly before the attack on Pearl Harbor, it was originally called Precision Specialties. And like Aurora, started out making plastic items on contract for other vendors. But unlike Aurora, it grew during World War II. Ironically, it was largely cosmetic cases that made up a fair chunk of their work. The customer, Revlon Cosmetics. Lou Glazer wanted to make the cosmetic cases under a new name. In a case of what today we would call crowdsourcing, he held a naming contest. Ravel was the winning entry because it had a similar sound to Revlon, but it was actually inspired by the French word Riviel, which means to awaken. So Precision Specialties made the Revlon cases under the Ravel name. After the war in 1946, Glazer took a shot at the toy market and it was a rough four years for Precision Specialties. They almost tanked despite repeated attempts to launch new plastic toy lines. They finally got traction in 1950 with a 1 scale pull toy model of a 1911 Maxwell automobile. This outdated car was made famous as the car Jack Benny used in his comedy routines. The car was a hit and Precision Specialties followed up with other cars in a series called Highway Pioneers. The series was a hit and unlike most offerings in the fickle toy market, demand stayed high year round, not just at holidays. So more toys were introduced. Precision Specialties was now on its way in the toy business. In 1950, Lou married his wife, Royal. A student at Berkeley who initially hailed from the American Midwest, she would become an important figure in Ravel's future. In 1952, Lou decided to get Precision Specialties into the new plastic kit model business with a detailed model of the USS Missouri Battleship. This was no small undertaking and he was betting the company on it. As part of this new direction, he completely renamed Precision Specialties Ravel. The Missouri model was a huge smash, and following its success, Ravel released a line of somewhat lower quality kit model jets. Like Aurora, Lou had an eye for what was new, and so he made what could be called a scientific wild ass guess at what the Navy's newest submarine, the nuclear-powered Nautilus, looked like. Aurora and Lindbergh were also making kits of the famous sub that were actually much more accurate than the Revell offering, but the Revell kit sold regardless. About this time, Tony Ballone, the artist who made the model for the Missouri molds, showed some small detailed figurines he had carved, and it was obvious that such figures could add life to the somewhat rudimentary models of the time and this began a trend that is now a staple of kit models. This also led to the 1953 introduction of Ravel's Masterpiece Miniature Series. Lou was afraid that the big companies like Mattel might get into the kit model business and crush a small operation like Ravel, so he focused on expanding the line as quickly as possible. This meant taking on debt. By 1954, Ravel was producing an expanding catalog of kits with beautiful artwork provided largely by Scotty Edison and later Hungarian-born Richard Kishady. Ironically, Kishady had been a Hungarian combat pilot who flew Stukas and Falkowulf 190s against the Russians before immigrating to America. Throughout the 1950s, Ravel grew and sales soared. The factory was enlarged and morale was high. Lou Glazer treated his employees very well and was in fact paying above the industry standard wages. He ate lunch in the company cafeteria and talked with his employees. Like the folks at Aurora, he kept in close touch with the workers. This makes a good segue into the person that Lou Glazer was. Originally from New York, Lou and his family moved to California when he was a kid. Hardworking and curious by nature, he was well liked by everyone but he was also a workaholic, much to the occasional irritation of his wife, Royal. She said he would sometimes fall asleep at dinner and then work right through the night. His dedication to Ravel was without question. In 1958, Glazer formed Ravel of Great Britain and later Ravel of Germany. In 1959, they marketed their kits in Japan, although they would bounce around between numerous vendors. By the early 1960s, about 20% of Ravel's profits were coming from overseas sales. 
In 1967, Ravel, which already had a prodigious product line, introduced what many modelers feel is the best kit series of modeling's golden era, the 132nd scale World War II combat aircraft series. The first of these kits with their outstanding artwork by Jack Glenwood was the P-40E. It was followed by the BF-109F and the Spitfire Mark I. Many modelers feel that the P-40 was nearly perfect. The line later added a JU-87B Stuka, a P-47D Thunderbolt, P-51B Mustang, an F-4F-4 Wildcat, an A6M50, and a UH-1D Huey and AH-1G Cobra helicopters, and later even a Hawker Hurricane. These kits are still popular today, sometimes commanding over $50. The series was so popular that more kits were added to the line up to the mid-1970s, including a Corsair and a Phantom Jet, amongst others. The end of the 1960s brought new problems to Ravel, the chief of which was Lou Glazer's cancer diagnosis. He underwent treatments and continued to work into the early 1970s, but the new decade had more obstacles for Ravel. One issue that began to crop up, probably in no small part to the Vietnam War, was why so many products were military in nature. Lou Glazer simply and honestly answered that those were the kits that sold. Ravel had an enormous number of non-military subjects, but combat aircraft and vehicles still made up a good portion of their product line. In order to stay in business, they had to follow the popular trends or risk going under. Ravel had always been in a financially precarious situation. They had a wide and varied product line and international presence, but that required great expenditures. This was the risk that had to be taken in order to be a major player in the industry. By early 1972, Lou's illness forced him to work from home. He put his beloved and very competent wife, Royal, in charge. On September 12, 1972, Lou lost his battle to cancer. Both Lou and Ravel's board of directors had spent some time grooming Royal to take over the company. Despite the loss of such a well-liked and respected leader, Ravel continued on. Royal brought a certain pragmatism to Ravel that helped them stabilize and stay financially in the black. She did not have Lou's desire to be the biggest model company at all costs. She trimmed dead weight, consolidated the business, and got them back on a solid financial footing. In 1975, Ravel purchased Renwall's tooling. Royal explained that it was a cost-effective way to extend Ravel's product line at a low cost. Ravel's R&D and marketing teams found ways to keep Ravel relevant. Everything from movie tie-ins to sponsorships of drag racers and models of wacky cartoon vehicles. Some of the purists in the design department were not too thrilled about some of the whimsical models, but they were a success. In 1976, America's bicentennial year, a model of the Goodyear blimp was made and it was a huge success, if even only for that one year. Around this time, the space shuttle was entering the American lexicon, and Ravel wasted no time in making a model with working bay doors. Ravel stayed nimble. As the sales of dragsters sagged, Ravel began producing a line of tractor trailers and semi truck models to cash in on this CB radio and trucker craze. They even made a deal with Billy Carter, President Jimmy Carter's colorful brother, to make a model of his truck, or more accurately, a truck that Ravel had made and gifted to him. In fact, despite all the challenges of the 1970s, 1976 turned out to be Ravel's pinnacle year with earnings of $34 million. But rising operating costs were eating into the profits. Things were okay for now, but they could see the storm on the horizon and nobody was kidding themselves. Unlike their chief competitor, Monogram, Ravel had a high cost operation and something had to change in order for the company to survive. Ravel had to break the $3 price barrier for kit models, which was considered industry changing. Royal kept fighting, but everywhere she looked, Barbie dragons. Enough was enough and it was time to merge the company or sell it. In 1979, Ravel was sold to a French operation, Compagnie Générale des Jouets and a French transition team started moving in. The French promptly outsourced much of the work and let many of the employees go. 
Some got jobs with the new company, but many did not. It was the beginning of the 80s, and a new way of doing business had arrived in Venice. Royal was given a seat on the board, but in 1982 she left Ravel, closing the door on a 41-year long leadership cadre at Ravel. Four years later, in 1986, the French company decided that Ravel was not meeting their expectations and it was sold to the Odyssey Group. The Odyssey Group had recently acquired Monogram Models and after 45 years of head-to-head -head competition, the two companies were merged in Ravel Monogram. The operation in Venice was closed and everything was moved to Monogram's facilities in Illinois. The old Ravel was gone, but the name and the kit survived. 